maybe just to start with one first question that struck me if, if we oppose uh, the first presentation much more about image, about uh, not only globalized image, but it's still in some way in the core of your work also. Uh, we can have kind of the same image, the same brand image from China to United States, as we said, but there's not one. There might be a same brand going everywhere, but that, that same brand, as you showed, is anyway a construction of something coming from everywhere. So it's a much more complex uh, process that we have on your side than on his side, but maybe I'm wrong. It's a complex question, or do you want to put it in another way? Um, image. Image. I mean, I imagine it's kind of similar. Like, you have like, I don't know, big pop, international pop stars that dominate most music. And then there's smaller stuff. Is that the question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. If you, if you take, uh, for example, the peace, the peace sign that you showed that kind of became a corporate brand that could be used wherever. Um, if, if you look at the music, you have brands used everywhere, but it's not necessarily those that interest more people. Maybe in China, it's not number one in the head parade, or there, there's much attention to, to all the music coming from China, uh, and so on. There c couldn't be just one music really, really making people happy worldwide, while uh, there certainly could be an image constructed uh, uh, after a few years, after uh, 10 years, 20 years, and become a really the image of something worldwide. Like maybe the axe, the axe example. I mean, I think in, in music you also have like these pop songs that become very, very important in quite many places, I would say. Uh, but then you have also, yeah, it's multi-layered, you have other uh, pop traditions in, in, the, in the specific places, and maybe you has also have also certain different meanings of this, uh, this uh, global pop track or something. So it's, it's very complicated what a track means in a certain place, but I'm sure there's some tracks reaching very far. And it's also, this is also turning around because there was not so many, I don't know if there was like, a, like the Gangnam style, uh, if like 10, 15 years before there was like a, a pop song that could be considered like worldwide well known that would come not from Europe and the US. I was thinking about that. If you have suggestions, what was there like a, a really big song uh, in the... 80s, 70s from Africa or Asia that everyone knew. So it's, it's turning around a little bit, I think. But then it's not a typical Korean song either. It's what really is typical anymore? I mean, what is typical? We have access, uh, some with slower, some with faster internet. Uh, and uh, yeah, we try to, I mean, it to could work, been, it produce could with the stuff that we hear. And that it we really are. could have been made in Los Angeles as well as in uh, South Korea. Maybe, if you would probably analyze the song or the video more closely, there might be a lot of local stories inside. One should uh, be, I think, it's, it's delicate to judge very quickly. When you start to analyze a song from a perspective where, where it comes from, then it's often very local story, I think. Uh, Not always. Uh, yeah. I, I guess I just wanted to add like maybe one way that you could think that there's where the the realism thing comes in with music is like I'm sure that there's like no culture that doesn't have a music right and so that would that's kind of evidence that music is something that become that comes before culture or it's like it's like very you know species specific to humans yeah there are many books about that but many that I didn't that I haven't read so <laughs> if music was before culture or uh, um, yeah. But I, I see some connections between your two presentations and I'm really interested, Thomas, in this idea of an archive and why would at some point 
um, how would taste actually define what is good or what is worth listening to or not, and why some types of music would um, be shared more or travel better, etc. In the sense that I, I think there it ties in well with uh, this concept of evolution that Timur introduced before as a factor of selection. Somehow, if I if I if I if I understood you well, this idea that, for example, stock imagery the image that you've shown of tomatoes that are actually recognizable everywhere, be it in Switzerland, or in Asia, and Africa, we recognize those shiny tomatoes or the freshly roasted coffee. Uh, in that sense, those images have been s automatically selected, so to speak, right? Because they became so successful for us as a result of evolution. I was wondering if we could make a connection with music because this is only applied to image, right? Those kind of if we can say um, evolutionary successful image, can we apply the same ideas to successful music? Because they're commercially successful, it means that they're fruit of you know an evolutionary path, or is that a bit too far fetched? I think you can you could do an analysis of sounds and sound effects that became. Uh, very, very successful that you find uh, in many, many different music styles uh, in different countries. Uh, so you should go also to the, the producers of these audio softwares. Of, uh, at all, that, that's sometimes uh, that, what, what we, what we uh, forget to, to listen to, what kind of sounds uh, and effects are getting far. I mean, now at the moment, uh, auto tune was terrible. Was uh, with uh, like in our place, it was like uh, uh, some years ago. It was used heavily. Now it's in Egypt. Maybe you heard a little bit. And uh, in uh, in north north of Mali, they work a lot with with auto tune. So with the auto tune effect. So you can say you can like it or hate it, but it's like a success story of this effect somehow. And uh, that's that's within the music. Somehow, so it's not on the level of the of the style or, or something that I think I think but it's interesting to watch. But you mean so it's the the music kind of making that decision rather than very conscious decisions that we could make as cultural producers or musicians, right? Like the music travels by itself and therefore has success in one side of the planet and then another. And going back to Levi Bryan's theories of new materialism that would kind of put the emphasis on the object, which is in this case music, rather than on our decisions based on taste or our understanding of taste. Equal. Yeah? It's not, one, it's not one rather than the other. I think it's just to say that there's both things going on. And I think maybe like, um, like uh, like hip hop seems like that's something that's totally spread, right? Like sure, yeah. every culture has its own hip hop. Um, but I also wanted to say that, like f in the example, also what's really important is to recognize that when you're talking about things evolving, that it's that evolution is contingent. So um, tomatoes, you know, are they they're native to South America, and coffee beans are, f I think, also South American. I'm not sure. So that there's there's a contingency that it's not that there's like, you know, coffee or tomato that's like this essence that like draws us to this perfect tomato or coffee. It's just that it happens to be through various different factors, a thing that becomes more popular. And it's also uh, it's decisions, it's strategies. I mean, uh, we should stop thinking that uh, an African musician <coughs> wants to become famous and that and come to Europe, you know? It's like, Europe is like, it's peanuts for him. The market is like, there's no market actually. So, at, and within uh, Ghana, for example, where I was there, these guys, what they do is like, they, they try to make a lot of noise. They do a video, they try to get a lot of likes and clicks. And then you have, uh, we can like it or not again, you have a mobile phone company like Vodafone or another company that make this musician an ambassador and that is like the strategy and if they come to to Europe for them it's like uh, they say you should pay more you should pay more because we get much more at home you know it's like uh, so it's not like uh, things are changing also it's not everything targeted towards us it's like also local stories basically 
I was struck also in both speeches about the, the notion of authenticity and how it becomes a new, I mean, every new product, every new mixture of music has its own authenticity, of course, and it brings the next step to, of authenticity. At the end, the globalized products is, is as authentic than uh, uh, the 400 different products that made it, isn't it? Can we put it that way? Sure, I mean, you, I always think uh, you can be lucky if, if if you listen to a lot of music, may, there might be a lot of music you don't think it's like new or fresh or like exciting or so. So I think you can always be just, I, I don't need more than someone where I feel uh, a musician or an artist that, that, uh, that brings together like, uh, that creates a voice somehow. And that's maybe 5% of, uh, of everything. If this voice is, out, then maybe it is authentic, I don't know. But it's like the, it's a struggle to to find your own voice to define uh, what you want to say clearly. It's also like in a, uh, in presentations like this, these things some often fall apart, and sometimes you find the right uh, the way, and then it's maybe authentic. And and the other way, it's like people start uh, are annoyed, bored. You know, it's like it's just working, working, working. Passion, maybe a little bit of luck, talent. Uh, and then, I don't know, authentic, you can start from, from where do you want to start? We heard about uh, uh, where all this mathematic uh, comes from, you know, so is, is everything, these computer things, is this like American when they use computers, you know, it's like... People saying that world music is not authentic. Of course, if you compare it to the uh, to the origin, it's not authentic. But it's a new kind of authenticity, of course. And people are listening to that, are interested in that authenticity, not in the first one that maybe sounds old-fashioned or that doesn't correspond to anything they they like. So. Yeah, and world music is often very. I mean, the, the the world music that you would find it's changing, but the world music that you would find in the in the record store, if there's still a record store. Uh, <laughs> It's often very sweet and nice, you know, and uh, there's like uh, today a lot of people who want to hear a bit more weird and harsh sounds, more manipulated sounds, like so it's changing tastes as well, changing generation. And there is still you have some actors in the field that you have different uh, sets of music parallel, basically. And you also said that music is free, but not necessarily a musician. It's true, every week we have news of uh, African musicians that couldn't come to Europe because uh, they hadn't uh, the right visa and so on. So it's really, there's a huge gap and it's not getting better. Yeah, it's getting worse. Yeah. So, Elise, do you have a question? Okay, so let's start uh, to ask, is there somebody? Yes, Paul, you have a question. Maybe. Um, thank you, the, uh, both, of, both of the talks were really, really nice. Um, <coughs> two questions or notes, one is that, um, to Timur, and it's also maybe a borders on the discussion of authenticity, um, is that um, the installation pictures that you showed us in the very beginning from your last show um, are so well produced that they actually look like architectural renderings. They look like computer renderings. So could you maybe tell us your views about this sort of converging aesthetics that we have worked by Kate Cooper, for example, that starts to become more and more realistic but still has this sort of little gap that we also talked about yesterday, the uncanny valley, that's not be, like, getting less and less uncanny. And on the other hand, uh, building physical objects and in installations that look like computer-generated imagery. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I guess how I justify my blatant formalism is um, that I guess, yeah, I see it as like that there's there must be some sort of um, attractor a structure in how images work and that um, and this is and they're not eternal structures either you know but for now for how people and how brains and how we work um, there's certain uh, aesthetics that 
seem to work cross culturally and um, and yeah. So does that explain it? Like, yeah. And the second one <coughs> was um, yeah. I would like to hear you elaborate on what you mentioned in terms of um, material cultures, but also non-human agency or non-human ontologies, independent ontologies. It's like sort of things that have their own kind of reality going on. A uh, little bit like what I mentioned when I, when I was talking about techno technology becoming evolutionary and, and uh, starting to develop on its own. Yeah, um, <coughs> right, that's a, um, a big thing just to, like for us to recognize that culture is you know, not just this war of different ideologies and different people's political interests, while that definitely is still a big part of it, it's also just these really random um, things that have to do with, with uh, biology and with uh, geology and, um, yeah, these, these things. Is that something maybe that in, in, in your field is also interesting? You were just talking about music software and the way that you know, s s certain configurations of software, of course, affect a certain kind of uh, approach towards sound that reacts differently when it comes from, say, a Western context and then is used and appropriated in, in, in an entirely different context. So how do the tools shape what we do? The tools first bring uh, possibilities to uh, when you look in Asia or Africa, these guys are, are having a lot of softwares, they're working with softwares that we work too here. Uh, the tools sometimes also uh, uh, bring a gap, I, I, I feel, a little bit, because you, if you have uh, music experts here who are into the production of music and stuff, they will often say that uh, like new music from these places, that it's all just presets, the, tr the sound is not treated properly. You know, they're really like the, the experts. So you have a lot of, uh, in the underground music scenes, you have a lot of criticism of these upcoming uh, musicians that, uh, that are just uh, doing also try and error. Also in Europe and the US, there's also try and error, but maybe there is also more competition between the different uh, musicians you can go and watch an amazing uh, uh, live show uh, and in Beirut you are there are two or three good rock bands and then you start to feel that you're the best rock band in the Middle East and you never hear another rock band so it's it's uh, so the softwares and the stuff it brings possibilities but it is still also uh, yeah I don't know how to answer it but it's Maybe one last question: Is there is there um, music software being uh, coded in, say, Lebanon, for example? Are there like small groups who create their own software? Because we, if, if like a major Western company creates a physical modeling uh, software, will naturally work with a certain set of instruments, with a certain set of tunings, and stuff like this. So, is there is there like a small hacking scene scene that uh, creates I don't know their own uh, super collider? plugins or something like that? Not so much that I, that I actually heard of. It's, lo it's more like, I mean, some people, they work just with Max MSP and create their, their own uh, variations or mm -hmm. possibilities. Uh, no, not, not so much in the, okay. in, in the Middle East, but I might be wrong. There might be some. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. May I? Okay. It's actually a question for Thomas. Uh, I gotta admit, I had a bit of a hard time following the um, thought processes that led to the decisions you made. Um, and what I was mainly wondering about, you were talking in the beginning, or in the introduction, you were saying something about uh, new music and experimental music and new generations trying to find new languages to express new things and but what then what we heard um, what me co confused me a little bit was like formally 
it was more like re regional reinterpretations of stuff that's formally really close to things we know from throughout the past, I don't know, up to 30, 40 years. Um, and so I was thinking, I was hoping, you probably think or hear something that I don't, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Because for me, of course, the, the, in trying to invent new languages means something else than that a little bit. So I'd be curious about that. I mean, on, on one hand, you're, uh, you're completely right. That's a little bit also what I was, was talking about. It's almost everything is done, you know? When they come up with something, you would, you would say like, oh, that's like past art pop from 1990, or this is like this, or this like this, you know? So it, it, there is maybe not, uh, not so often that you really think it's like a really new sound. But I think well, uh, what, where you can see a fresh approach is, is it's, it's like the way they combine maybe uh, things from low uh, art music and, and uh, pop music. They go to uh, the really cheesy uh, local uh, folklore and they, uh, yeah, but they uh, manipulate it with experimental music techniques. Uh, in free improvised music in, in Europe, for example, I don't hear that so often that you would like in, in Switzerland that someone would work with uh, Volkstümliche, uh, like uh, Wiesel Gier, like this Volkstümliche Schlager, you know, to, to work on really popular material with experimental approaches, I don't hear so often. And maybe it was like Bastard Pop a little bit like this. Um, then it's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's very multi multidisciplinary, I think. Maybe a, a little bit more than, uh, than in other places. But you're right, I mean, it's you, if you want to go out and find the new sound, it's, uh, it takes time, you know, it's, it's a lot of research and that's what, what I try to do. I try to find voices that are, that are interesting, that are trying to, uh, to evolve, that are sometimes alone, uh, that are young, they don't have, uh, they can't compare, they cannot really grow, so it's like, yeah, but you have to, to work somewhere, and we, if, if we say there's nothing new, it's, it's in a way good, I think. It's in a way good, because you have to be critical, um. and on the other hand, uh, we should also just let them play and see where it reaches to. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, uh, it's also not that long time ago that you find uh, renderings of urban music of pop music from these places within Europe. It was always Asia was, was exotic, traditional, blah, blah, blah. And it was Asian underground beats from uh, drum and bass beats with some sitar on top. And now it's like it's turning around a bit. Okay, yeah, I guess, yeah. The, the confusion was on some other end with that. It's not that I'm not trying to say it's not new or anything, right? It is new approaches and it's, of course, it's different because it's regionally different and the backgrounds are different, but it's, I guess, just that assumption of language versus a new articulation. Like, these are two, I think, differences. And it's a new articulation, but it's not a new language. I guess. Maybe, yeah. No, but it's a, it's but a good thanks. question. I'm thinking about these things all the time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> like this, the way you described of like taking pop elements and then kind of remixing them, or I think that like that's definitely the same thing that's happening in my practice and taking very popular commercial images or popular culture uh, things and then sampling them. And I want to ask uh, you, how do you explain the gap between uh, artistical uh, 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 
creation, when artists, they are learning through each other, through networks and different culture, and what's going on in our world. Uh, why we, there is this gap between real world and artistic world? How you explain it? We, we didn't understand really the gap between Yeah, okay. <laughs> How you explain the gap between artistic world and the real world? Because you said that artists, they are learning through each other, through networks, through the different culture. They are inspiring each other to, uh, to, to their different culture. But what's going in the real world is not the same. We see the nationalism is going more and more up and uh, how you explain this gap between real world and artistic world? When I, when I do like, in, when I write like uh, as an academic, I, I have like three, three main fields that I, that I actually analyze. Uh, one is like the, <laughs> the production of music, the music itself, uh, what is happening here, how it is produced, blah, blah, blah. Then I analyzed uh, what happens with music when it w becomes a media product and it, uh, it goes to different places through, through uh, labels, uh, funding, uh, funding bodies, through media, blah, blah, blah. So it's, uh, with the piece itself, it has its own life, basically, uh, with different actors. And then I have the, the, the field, uh, the musician or the sound artist, as a, as a person within his environment, within his possibilities and, uh, and uh, hurdles. And uh, it's uh, very, I didn't talk about this today, it's just uh, in, the, in the end I said a little bit that all these things are actually quite fragile because uh, a lot of people take a lot of risks uh, in trying to find new visions. <laughs> No, I mean, if you're in uh, Pakistan, for example, I, 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 I was with these, with these rappers that, that, uh, that made uh, video clips against uh, all these uh, landlords, the big landlords and the sons of the landlords that can do every, anything and they, they, can, they can kill someone and they get away with it. And so these guys put this out uh, with in, on, on YouTube sometimes on the, on the wrong names. And they, they, risk, they risk a lot, so the, the local history or the local place is, is very... It's the central part of things, actually, still, I would say. But it's a long question. I have a question for Timur. Uh, in some of the displays of your work you showed, uh, there was clearly the, the aesthetic of a uh, funeral, funeral presentation, whereas uh, the, the product presented wasn't, uh, wasn't in that sense, uh, in the same um, idea. Uh, what is it? Is it just if, if we have the idea of getting to one kind of image, as we're all going to die, let's make it easy and go to the funeral image that concerns us all at one stage, or, or is it something else? Um, I guess what uh, interested me in the funeral thing was um, like, uh, the, like the archaeological evidence for intentional burial um, happens kind of around this time before Homo sapiens. So there's species that were intentionally burying their, their dead. Um, before humans came around, or but if you think about it, that's kind of really the moment when, when people start thinking about themselves and in a different way because they start thinking about the afterlife, and so then they so it's evidence that that's the moment when people could start reflecting on, on life, I guess, and not just what animals do, I guess, of just dying somewhere, and. Um, so that was really interesting for me. And also just, uh, yeah, just this idea that there's these kind of fundamental primal things that are going on with how we um, 
arrange spaces and arrange ceremonial spaces, and one of those ceremonial spaces would be the retail space as well. And and I, I just wanted to draw that connection, I guess. More questions? Do you have, do you have, you have a question? Yeah, maybe one more last question to you, Timur, because I didn't, I didn't follow. Can you explain again what's this <coughs> salted cracker experiment with the Jeff Koons and the river? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so they tested to see like why um, shiny and reflective things are attractive to people. And the hypothesis was that it has something to do with water. And so to, to prove that, they, they had two groups and they both had to eat these salty crackers and then they both uh, had to rate different kinds of various images. And then the ones that didn't get the water that were still thirsty, they rated the images of, of shiny things higher, yeah. And there's like all kinds of stuff like this, like um, for example, you know, we see images of people getting sp water splashed in their face all over. And the, there's this thing, there's this like, uh, there's this physiological effect called the mammalian diving reflex that we have, which is as soon as we get water on our face, our heartbeats drop by like 10%. And it's, uh, it's thought that this is something that w evolved, you know, f so that we don't freak out if we fall in the water, and mammals, you know, have this. And, uh, and then if you think about that in combination with mirror neurons, that when we see, like, an advertisement of somebody getting water splashed in their face, like, I think the chances are, and I actually haven't read anything to prove this, but that because of that image, we ourselves then have, like, a, a, a small drop in our heart rate, and so it's a relaxing image. Yeah. All right, thank you. Is there another question? No, just, oh, okay. Last question, very last question. No. We're in time. Okay, it's uh, regarding the music. Uh, watching your, your presentation, it was rather oriented to popular or commercial music. And uh, I was thinking, is there two kinds of music in our, in our world? The serious music, which is maybe academic, like classical music or uh, electroacoustic or whatever, and the other ones coming from the, the mass, which is reflecting our era or whatever. Are you interested in, is it right to speak about serious music and non-serious music first? And are you interested in two serious music, like classical, what was not presented to your presentation? Sure, there's still the, the whole uh, high school of music, arts school uh, site, where people, jazz schools and everything, where people can uh, uh, learn music, basically. Uh, huh? And make money. Maybe. And, uh, but it's also, I mean, the, the people in, in, in these places where, where I worked in Beirut, they are often autodidacts basically and uh, they they sometimes if they have a, an art school they would not be in in the music section because the music section for them was was always it's, it's a bit uh, conservative so they were more like into visual arts uh, video kinds of things like this uh, i'm also i'm interested in what used to be called art art music i i, I kicked it out today uh, for uh, several reasons, and uh, there is uh, that's also if if you ask for new voices within uh, within the art music circle, there you have actually some composers and musicians who a few who know very well Arabic music or Indian music because this music is is constructed completely different. It's not like, it's like uh, you start, very easily said, you start very low, you go up, it's a different arrange, arrangement, it's a different way of where you can put which, uh, which melody or which uh, ornamentation. 
And so these guys, uh, they, they do uh, Arabic music, Indian classical music with different instruments, basically. So it's in, on the, at, the, at the core, it's like uh, it's, it's an Arabic or a, an Indian music, but it would not sound Indian or Arabic to you, maybe. And uh, so that's uh, what sometimes people call alternative modernity. So finding modernity within your own principles and stuff. Uh, that's that's probably uh, kind of a new new music, a new phenomenon. Uh, but it's also sometimes a bit delicate because I don't want to go there and say you should work on Arabic music or you should work on Indian music. So, but it's one thing that that is happening. And then again, the, the, the really the players of Arabic music or Indian music, the, the pros would say this composer has no clue about Indian music. He makes everything wrong. So, uh, so he could tell in Europe this very interesting story, but there it would, you know, it's like, it's very complex. It's all fragile uh, people, as yeah. It's all uh, moving. No one has a little, really a lot of support, and maybe sometimes the wrong people get the support. And then you have to ask who is wrong, who is the right people. I don't know. Just searching. Thank you. Just searching. That will be the last word and the conclusion of those two very, very interesting days. Thank you very much uh, for today, for um, Timur Sikun and Thomas Burkhalter for those very interesting talks and presentations. We can clap.